Greetings. My name is Joshua Free. I'm the uh, director of the Mardukai Research Organization, uh, Mardukai Chamberlains, and uh, also the author of many books now released through the Joshua Free Publishing imprint. Um, so what we are talking about in this series is a uh, continuation of uh, investigating in the Mardukai Core. Mardukai Core being the research library developed by um, myself, the Mardukai Chamberlains, almost 10 years ago. It's now being uh, released as the 10th anniversary collector's editions and commemorative editions. In our previous series, we discussed the core source book, um, the uh, Necronomicon, the Anunnaki Bible. This is the 10th anniversary collector's edition hardcover. It's also available as the complete Anunnaki Bible a source book of esoteric archaeology in paperback. Uh, there's also an abridged paperback version of the Necronomicon Anunnaki Bible as well. Um, recently released is the Year 3 materials, which has uh, come out, it's uh, May 30th is the release date for hardcover, it is Necronomicon, the Anunnaki Grimoire, a manual of practical Babylonian magic. It deals with materials that have previously been released as either Complete Book of Marduk by Naboo, in addition to the Maklu Ritual book. And uh, this grimoire includes also some additional information that was previously released as Liber E, uh, Megan Magic or Necronomicon Spellbook, and um, also as an appendix, uh, Anakian Magic and Kabbalah uh, discourse that I released in, I believe, 2011. So, what are current, uh, currently, we are dealing with materials that, um, our second year of work, the Sumerian Legacy, a guide to esoteric archaeology, also available in the hardcover anthology, Gates of the Necronomicon, the secret Anunnaki tradition of Babylon. The dedication on the Royal Library of King Ashurbanipal reads as follows. The palace of Ashurbanipal, king of the world, the king of Assyria, who in Ashur and Belit puts his trust, on whom Nabu and Tasmitu have bestowed broad ears, who has acquired clear eyes, the valued products of the scribe's art, such as no one among the kings who has gone before me had acquired, the wisdom of Nabu unequaled, as so much as I can find. I have inscribed on tablets and arranged in groups. I have revised, and for the sign of my reading, have set in my palace this library. I, the ruler, who knows the light of Ashur, the king of the gods. So now, Ashur was actually the Assyrian name for uh, Marduk, although, as you can see, Nabu uh, appears into the text uh, verbatim. The Sumerian Legacy, a guide to esoteric archaeology by Joshua Free, is a compendium of the second year material of the active group known as the Mardukite Chamberlains, which formed 10 years ago, actually a little over 10 years ago now. Um, it basically, our original, the complete Anunnaki Bible, or Necronomicon, the Anunnaki Bible, uh, composes a complete collection of the most ancient materials, the most ancient literary or written materials on the planet. And then an exploration into those, how it might apply uh, to practical revival, or also uh, what I call esoteric archaeology, or even Mesopotamian neo-paganism um, appears in paperback as the Sumerian legacy and then those materials also appear within the hardcover anthology Gates of the Necronomicon the secret Anunnaki tradition of Babylon. So what academic scholars term Babylonian mythology um, it's actually a a civic uh, internal evolution of a former uh, Sumerian Anunnaki legacy. And uh, it's a progression of uh, the archetypal uh, Anunnaki family in Mesopotamia. Uh, not simply a, a cultural assimilation or, or replication of a similar pantheon, 
Um, this is what we actually see in later uh, classical uh, mythoi, such as like the Greeks, the Romans, um, and even those that inherited the tradition of the Canaanites and uh, so forth, that inherited the tradition of Mesopotamia. Um, they basically, um, they kind of regurgitate the same themes with new names. And to some extent, we view the esoteric Babylonian religious and political pantheon um, as an extension of the older Sumerian one. And this gives us um, a way of, um, of putting it in perspective as far as the Anunnaki pantheon, but it also gives rise to many misunderstandings and misconceptions um, when you're interpreting tablets um, of the pantheon and similar names are sometimes the same names, um, but from different origins and time periods. Uh, in this case, however, uh, the, the Babylonian spiritual, religious, cultural, political focus uh, is transferred to the activities of the, the younger generation of Anunnaki gods, um, which are sealed as the gate tradition um, in, in Babylon. And these are descendants of, and many of the same characters, but descendants of, for example, Anu, Enlil, and Enki, um, who represent more of the formative uh, supernal trinity in the older Sumerian uh, tradition, and then the crossover being the key um, characters of early astrology, the sun, the moon, and Venus being Nana, Shamash, and of course Nana Ishtar, um, carrying over into the Babylonian tradition, um, where you see Marduk um, becoming the Jupiter or the Enlil for the Mardukite or Babylonian tradition, Nabu assuming the Mercurian uh, position, um, replacing the former um, Nasaba, Ningajida, um, uh, the Thoth or Hermes of the, the older, uh, or not older, but other uh, traditions that were surrounding it in the ancient Near East. Um, so we're seeing a transition in Babylon um, during the trans uh, age shift between the age of Taurus and Asia areas approximately like 2160 BC um, and we see a shift in um, the way uh, things are being systematized, uh, understood, the expansion of the pantheon um, and also um, an emphasis on uh, control through for example magical practices, prayer and um, systematized um, existence in life. Things that the former Sumerian tradition really didn't have much of um, against popular opinion or misconception because um, a lot of those things are actually, for example, the Enuma Elish, the Epic of Creation, are actually uh, Babylonian in origin and not, not uh, of a former Sumerian uh, systemology. So in the former, like, Sumerian paradigm, you have Enlil and Enki that basically aid one another um, as brothers, as sons of, of Anu, um, half-brothers, um, aid one another in the foundation of the material world. Um, by the time of the Babylonians, each one of them has their own dedicated following, especially um, the, the, uh, each one has their own lineage. Um, the Enlilite lineage uh, versus Enki's um, for example, the son Marduk. Uh, so this split the global populations into like a, like a, a dualism, right? In the heart of the cradle of civilization, the heart of the ancient Near East. Um, so um, when we look at um, some of the older um, tablets regarding these beings, like for example, in the Sumerian sources, uh, we see um, like a schism um, kind of regarding humans, even though it isn't directly stated as such uh, regarding um, the creation of humans, the disposal of humans, or the deluge. For example, we see an inclination for Enki, uh, the chief scientist and magician of the Anunnaki, uh, to uh, genetically upgrade and utilize the hybrid individuals, uh, human, human creations. Um, whereas Enlil is an, the nationalist high commander of Anu, is actually kind of reserved and a little bit understandably against and sometimes angered by um, these beings, um, basically believing that they might 
serve to undo the power and authority and control of the Anunnaki. Um, Enki, uh, after the time of the Deluge, because of political issues with his own lineage under Enlai control, sees a potential in the human race to not only preserve his own legacy on Earth, but also that of his son, Marduk. So as the cuneiform writing literary tradition evolved, the systemization also evolved and changed and crystallized um, into the more familiar versions of the, the Mesopotamian mysteries that we kind of define it by today. Uh, in the beginning, this was not quite so clear cut and dry. Um, the, the domains, the names, the uh, areas that each deity focused on, even their religious um, support, these were not very clear cut and dry in ancient Sumerian times, um, especially uh, prior, prior to um, Babylonian systemization. Um, a lot of them were based on the just natural terrain and um, the populations, whether it was irrigation oriented for agriculture or a pastoral area, things of that nature. It was only later that they were collectively brought together and systematized as a, the original archetypal pantheon and the attributes, um, for example, to the gates of planets and uh, the other ways in which this is um, broken down. So this changed, this was new. Um, these uh, tablets that are collected, um, the, the, well, the raw tablets that are collected for the Anunnaki Bible and so forth, these were uh, avidly developed in uh, Babylon to solidify and protect the traditions um, and in a little bit way to manipulate them um, uh, because of the way in which uh, uh, they were the first time that things were labeled, the first times that things were systematized, um, classified. Um, things, things becoming things for the first time. And this affected the way people uh, experienced and interacted with these things in reality. And then of course the systems that corresponded with them. Um, concepts became words, words became data, data became facts. And we continue uh, to operate in this kind of uh, level of, of reality experience to this day, and also the methods of reality engineering. The fact that words, uh, words that stay, words that mean specific things can be deemed to uh, dictate and determine parameters uh, of our life, things that are actually artificially created, created either within consciousness or within some other subsystem that we agree to participate with. Although, of course, names um, for uh, the god Marduk, the patron god of Babylon, the Mardukite priests and priestesses of Babylon were, um, by nature, priests of Enki, uh, following a tradition from the ancient systems born in Eridu, which is a prehistoric, uh, the most ancient city of the modern re, uh, reinstitution of Mesopotamia after the Del Deluge, after uh, mankind was, was reseeded. Um, so beyond simply collecting data to support like a political belief system, the first practical, pragmatic, mystical, religious use of writing was recording of esoteric lore, the secret doctrines, and then exoteric incantations, which were later used to systematize appeals to the gods for material worldly assistance um, by participation of the people and the populace that uh, collectively would um, share this paradigm and contribute to the infrastructure of that society. So it's really not that hard then to see how these systems have evolved from where they began as the structuring of civilization out of seemingly nothingness um, then, then people were instructed to petition their needs to the temple priests and priestesses who would then in turn make appropriate offerings and incantations to the deity involved and 
by doing so, this system is is remains with us. It was so strongly ingrained that it remains with us in society today in both religion and politics where we have ministers and authorities that act as intermediaries between citizens and the perceptibly higher powers. So here we see at the beginning of the distinction between exoteric surface uh, like systemized religions of public opinion separate from a more secretive uh, esoteric uh, tradition of practices and so forth from the scribe priests and temple priestesses and priest kings themselves which were operating um, within the same paradigm as the rest of the population but at what we would consider a much deeper deeper level and so it is this deeper level and also the holistic understanding of it all that is the uh, the encompassing work of the Mardukite Research Organization today and the development of the uh, literary works that we present um, from the Joshua Free Publishing imprint.